Okay, thanks. Um, what I would like to, to share with you today is a little bit about a project that I've been working on for, for quite a while, at least with the carbon generation phase of things. Um, but I've been working on this um, in conjunction with Dr. Dana Miles, who is here in the room today. Wave your hand, Dana. <laughs> um, with USDA Agriculture Research Service, and also with Dr. Isabel Lima, who's also with USDA ARS at the New Orleans Center. And I am Carrie Fitzmaurice Brissolera, which is a huge Irish-Italian parade right in with itself. And I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Health at the School of Public Health at LSU. So really the way that we kind of started out with this whole process was to look at different agriculture waste streams and try to analyze these waste sources basically for their potential as activated carbon. So number one, could we create activated carbons from these waste sources? And then, well, if we create these carbons, what are we going to do with them? Um, so for this particular, um, this particular study that I'm going to talk about today is going to focus on ammonia, but that's not the only use that we have for these carbons and chars. So once we've created them, um, one of the, the best sources that we found after looking at multiple ones, which I'll talk a little bit about that, um, was that broiler litter was actually the best source that we found of all the different agriculture waste streams that we've tried. So we also went through, because we found out, okay, well, these carbons are working well. The first thing that we found that they were working really well at was with, with metals adsorption um, and aqueous solutions. So we figured that out, but then we didn't know why. <laughs> so we knew they were working. We knew we were absorbing a lot of metals, but we weren't exactly sure what was the mechanism of absorption. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those physical and chemical properties of these carbons. And then moving on down the line with looking at other things that maybe we could absorb with these carbons. So we thought about this from a true kind of value added and circular kind of process in that we wanted to try to use the waste to create a product that would in turn help us treat the emissions from the waste. Um, so to try to look at things through that, the bigger picture, through a bigger, bigger cycle. So uh, <laughs> the collection phase. Um, so we went through, we looked at, like I said, multiple different waste streams. So we went out to the hog farms at LSU. We gathered samples there. Um, we got poultry litter from Mississippi State University is where we started, um, and then moved on with some of Dana's collaborators at private farms just outside of Starkville. We also got dairy manure um, from Kentwood, Louisiana, home of Britney Spears, just in case anybody's interested in that. Um, and we also tried turkey, and to date we have tried things as random as trout manure, actually collected and dewatered from trout farm facilities. And you want to talk about smell. <laughs> I've smelled a lot of things in my, uh, in my area of research, both the municipal side and the ag side, and there's nothing like some trout manure, I'll tell you. So from that point, we took these different waste sources and developed these activated carbons. So we made first activated carbons. We weren't looking at the chars. We were trying to make the best product we could that would actually, we thought, have a fighting chance at producing a product that could absorb something. <clears throat> so you can see, this is just a, a SEM or scanning electron microscope picture of what these carbons look like. And the most important thing with them is the porosity, of course. So you can see this, and this is true of all activated carbons, whether they're from commercial sources made from coal or coconut shells or from the waste sources themselves. Um, and this was myself and Renee Labtech late one night trying to pelletize coal to make a uh, comparison source material there. So here's some more um, electron microscope pictures of the actual carbons from the poultry manure sources. So the picture on your left actually is a 2500 uh, magnification on the poultry cake carbon. This is on your, um, on your right, and it's a 250 magnification. The big thing when we sort of started this process was, okay, first of all, we knew that when we went in the poultry houses and we were collecting the manure, we were getting what we were calling cake, which was 
devoid of the majority of bedding material. It was more wet, more clumped there together. It had a higher concentration of pure manure. Um, whereas the litter, we were scooping of everything. So that included the, a high percentage of the bedding material itself, which is pretty easy to see the difference in the structure between these two. So you can kind of see the plant-based materials have more of a tendency to show these sort of almost tubule looking kind of structure in there. Whereas the cake carbon, the thing to notice here, all of these lighter gray particles are ash particles. We did have a really high ash concentration or ash content with both of these sources. And this is just your regular, regular kind of magnification there, just a regular picture of the carbon. So one of the, the big, or the big pluses, Price. I guess, of this kind of research was looking at, okay, we've got a source material that we can basically get for free. We just have to get it to the place. Um, this has also been looked at with regard to using it biosolids as a precursor. Um, so not just agriculture waste, but also from the municipal waste side. Um, with the biosolids, this three to ten dollars per ton, that all depends on if you're doing any pretreatment to it, dewatering, did you get it up to class B, is it class A, what kind of things you've done to it before you're going to make the activated carbon. Now one of the most common sources um, of precursor for activated carbons on the commercial market is bituminous coal. This, um, as of 2000, 2010, I think was the last time I looked at those numbers, was a little over $60 a ton for bituminous coal. Another very common source is um, coconut shells. Well, those are highly market dependent as well. Um, sometimes they're very difficult to get. And um, so their cost can escalate all the way up to that $60 to $80 range as well. So when you look at that as compared to when you take, say, a waste, so even if we're looking at it in terms of biosolid costs, which is going to be higher than some of our agriculture waste costs, we're looking at about six times um, a, pro a price reduction based on our source material if you compare, even if we look at the high end of $10 a ton for biosolids versus the low end of coal of $60 a ton. So we're already saving money. Um, this is just another, um, just a couple of schematics to, to look at coal production and also the cost of fossil fuel receipts um, at some of the electric generating plants. Now market-wise, activated carbon is kind of, everyone's looking at that as one of the larger markets for the future. So what they are anticipating is that virgin activated carbon market is actually going to increase or rise anywhere from 10 to 15 percent yearly through 2014. Um, the global market is forecast to reach a market size of about 2.3 million metric tons by the year 2017. So what I'm seeing here is just to show you the demand. So there is a distinct need for activated carbon. Um, so what we're trying to do is maybe come into that market where we can see this demand increasing over time. Um, right now, the primary uses are, of course, water treatment um, and air purification. The three largest players in activated carbon are Calgon, um, Norit, and then Mead West Vaco. The Calgon um, did report, which they are very closed mouth about <laughs> their reporting, of course, um, reported cost of products sold increased about 8.5%. Um, to 95.5 million just in the third quarter of 2011. Now, the, when we started to look at these carbons and the creation of these carbons, we actually first started out looking at the metals absorption. Um, and at that time, we looked at that because we knew that was a niche within the carbon market because there is nothing out there that is available commercially um, not an activated carbon at least, that can remove metals from aqueous solution. Well, what we discovered is ours can. Um, and then looking at the current value on the market is around $1.50 a pound. Is kind of what your generic, good quality activated carbon is going for. If you're looking for 
a specialty carbon, you can get upwards of $15 to $20 a pound. Um, and so what we had, I think the last numbers that we had, the last time we did a full economic big picture analysis of the creation of these carbons, I think they were, the production cost was around 55 to 60 cents a pound. So when you think about you've created a specialized carbon that current market demand has shown could bear maybe the cost of selling this at somewhere around 10 to $15 a pound, you can see the potential for, um, for money to be made. Oh, so again, these are some of the common sources. We talked about the coal and the coconut shell. Um, alternative sources that also work from an ag side um, are the nutshells. Those seem to do really well. Um, they do really well simply because of their strength. So they don't tend to break down. We don't get that high ash content that we see with some of the manures. Also, sugarcane bagasse and soybean hulls. Those tend to work better as ion exchange resins, um, which are just another form of adsorbent. So activated carbon from waste. Um, really, there's a lot of research going on. It's a pretty widely developing field. Biosolids is a big part of that um, on the municipal side, simply because the way I view it and the way I view kind of biosolids in general in that field of waste treatment and product development is there's a lot of investment coming in from that side um, to help them cover those capital costs, the startup costs. Um, a lot of the studies though with biosolids haven't really taken it to that next step of activation. So they're just looking at pyrolysis, um, possibly bio oil production or gasification, some way to produce fuel, not so much produce an adsorbent. Um, tires and paper mill waste, there's also been a pretty good chunk of research on those, um, those precursors as well. So this is just kind of a, in a nutshell, some of those, not to be funny because that is nutshells there on there, um, but our carbons, how we make them, they're coming from pelletized manure, we're using steam activation, not a chemical evac activation process. Um, the coal, the coconut shell, the wood-based, these last three are what we would consider a high quality generic activated carbon. So from three different companies. So the pure, this is a replacement filter, it's coal derived. That's the filters that you find in your um, sort of Brita filter, the pure filter itself that you use for filtering your tap water, drinking water filters. Um, Calgon has the filtrasorb, which the last I heard, they're actually starting to, to phase that out. They're supposed to be coming out with something new and impressive, but I haven't heard what that is yet. Um, but you can see the theory here with all three of these are coal derived. So the only difference is Norit tends to use more of the lignite coal versus the, the bituminous. So the activated carbon that we'll talk about today, um, I'm just going to focus kind of on that ammonia work. I thought that would be the most applicable um, here. The old preliminary studies or the initial studies that we did, we were looking at samples of poultry litter that we connect, collected through Mississippi State University's poultry program. Um, the bedding that they used, so we included the bedding material since we're calling it litter, um, was actually pine shavings. Now our newest studies um, that we're currently working on, we were actually using a poultry litter from a North Louisiana private farm, but the big difference is they were using rice hulls as a bedding material as compared to the pine shavings. So we did the pyrolysis, the activation, we'll go through some of these chemical and physical properties and the results. So the characterization, really any kind of carbon that you have, you're going to go through both the physical properties, the chemical properties, and your adsorptive properties. That's your three big categories that you're concerned about. Um, so I'll show you some of the results. So as we went through, what we determined in order to help our carbons maintain a shape and to help them Kind of resist some of that ash production, we found that it was much better to pelletize the manure prior to creating the carbons. 
Um, so what we did was pelletize the material before we actually put it into the furnace. So for our pyrolysis, um, we did 700 degrees under nitrogen gas for one hour. We did in, then did a steam activation with a flow rate of three mils per minute. Um, and then we activated it at 800 degrees Celsius for 45 minutes. Now those numbers, and the reason why we chose the numbers that we did, those were based on all the previous studies that we had done looking at metals adsorption. So this was the optimum conditions that we got the best performing manure carbons for metals adsorption. So we figured it was a good place to start, at least, for the ammonia. Um, now, when we did a lot of these studies, we had looked at everything from 500C all the way up to activations at 900. So we had looked at a, a wide range, but we focused on this simply as a starting point and a way to, um, to get there for based on what it did for the metals. And these were the, the physical and chemical processes. So just to show you a little bit, these are the two different litter sources. So that first one was the Mississippi litter with the pine shavings, and the Louisiana litter that had the rice hull. So you can see we're pretty close. Um, this is the raw is the first line, and then the activated carbon is the second line of each of these, of each of these elements. Now all of these were run, what we did was acid digest. We developed our own acid digestion method because that carbon is extremely difficult <laughs> to digest and get into solution, um, and then ran these on ICP, or inductively coupled um, plasma technology. And also, I just wanted to, to kind of give you a snapshot here, too, because I had mentioned all the different types of manure that we had run. So this is a comparison of the broiler, the turkey, the swine, and dairy, along with some of those commercial sources. So. The percent yields, you can see there's a big difference between these manure-based carbons versus, say, coal. So we do have a much lower percent yield. Now, surface area is another one. This, um, our surface areas were running around 400, give or take, depending on which manure you were talking about. When you look at coconut shell and wood, you can see they're usually closer to 900. This we trust our, our data ran for 474, but again, that's a point of use kind of drinking water. It's not really indicative of what some of that Norit or Calgon carbons, those would be closer to 12 to 1500 is what the surface area we would expect. Now, I know this zero looks a little strange, and that's because we created that coal carbon ourselves. So we activated the coal and took it through the same process that we did with the manure. Well, coal is much too hard to try to activate just with steam. So that's why we really didn't get any surface area there. Um, and then also the attrition and the pH. The big notation with the pH is that our waste carbons tend to have a much higher pH than normal carbons. They also tend to want to push our solution pH as high, even if we use a buffered metal solution, say. They kind of always want to stay or push around the 8 to 9 range. Okay, so to get into the ammonia, um, the preliminary studies that we did actually showed that our carbons from the broiler litter could outperform the commercial carbons. Now this was not, um, we did some testing with a, um, a carbon that was on the market very briefly. Um, for about a year and a half, around 2004 to 2006, or 2004 to 2005, called Amazorb, which this carbon was created specifically for ammonia adsorption. No one wanted to pay $25 a pound for it, <laughs> so it did not survive. And it's not, to my knowledge, it's not still available um, at this point. So we did try some with the Amazorb. But the majority of our comparisons were made with a, a carbon that's commercially available. So that we use this Vapure, which is for air purification. It's not specific for ammonia, though. Um, our broiler litter carbon did resist the breakthrough about 21% longer than the Vapure, the commercial carbon. Um, the concentration of our gas was about... They got to where they were running. ...per minute for the broiler litter. 
and around 6.87 milligrams per minute for the vapure. That's just our initial starting kind of concentration, just to give you an idea that we were comparing apples and apples there. Um, our removal rates were about 0.98 milligrams per minute for the, the broiler-activated carbon. And it really was the maximum that was allowed by our experimental flow rates for those preliminary studies. And I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of our setup and method as well. So what you can see here, and it's a little fuzzy down here at the bottom, um, but these initial studies that we did was using ammonia directly from the tank. So we were using pure ammonia. Um, we were not using emissions yet from litter. So we had the tank, the ammonia tank, and the air tank mixed. We had our, um, our flow meters here. And this is our column here of our activated carbon. Now, another thing at that time, we were also using for our ammonia analysis a boric acid indicator. So we were using a titrometric method there um, in order to quantify the ammonia. So that presented us with a few problems there. Um, because the problem, I guess, mostly related to that is because of this. So when we were using that really high flow rate or high levels of ammonia going through there really quick, we were having breakthrough within a minute. When you're using that titrometric method, it's really hard to pull a sample and titrate it and know where you are before you've already missed breakthrough. Um, so we did this, but our overall kind of rough and dirty kind of samples or our results here, we actually got around 20 milligrams of nitrogen total absorbed over the full 20 minutes that we ran this, these samples. Um, whereas the Vapure was only able to absorb about 8.3 milligrams of nitrogen. Um, we did try to slow this down and go with a much lower flow. Um, we were able to extend it up to, I think it was 345 minutes for a total run instead of the quick 20 minute run. But our reps were not good at all there. So we had standard deviations with this milligram of nitrogen that would range probably around five milligrams. So we had, sometimes we had 9.6, I think 9.6, we had 13. We had a wide range. So basically what these preliminary results showed us was, okay, we're gonna need a new method. <laughs> um, that, okay, this gives us enough information to know that yes, these carbons have promise, but we're gonna have to figure out a different way to do this. Um, but we did, before we developed that new method, we went ahead and actually looked at this with the litter emissions. It seemed to work much better with that because it was a much slower um, kind of process. So you can see in our time over hours, these are our two carbons. This is the control or just the amount of ammonia coming from the litter samples is here. There's not a statistically significant difference until you get up to the 60-second hour. And once you get up to that point, we actually saw that the Vapure, the commercial carbon, was performing slightly better than the, um, the broiler carbon. So really quickly, um, recently what we have done is get our grubby little hands on one of those ANOVA photoacoustic analyzers, um, which made, of course, the ammonia analysis much, much better. Um, so we set up a schematic very similar to what we had before. The big difference, of course, was the, um, the analysis phase. So we've started things back up. Um, looking at, this was the Louisiana carbon, or the newer carbon, and these are various um, levels of carbon. So we had a 10 gram sample, a five gram, two grams, and one gram, doing kind of an isotherm to calculate uh, how well these carbons are performing. So we actually, have a lot of data that's looking like the, it's a very promising potential here for using these, uh, these carbons from waste sources, not only for metals, but also for, um, for ammonia. Um, the thing that we are still working on and kind of, I guess, as a future direction is, of course, to test all of the different types of waste sources because just because something did not perform great with metals does not necessarily mean it will not perform with the ammonia. The mechanisms are completely different. 
Um, we're also relatively sure that our carbons are not performing well simply due to surface area, as most commercial carbons do, um, because our surface areas are not very high. So we believe it's a chemical process that's going on, um, probably related to phosphorus levels and the phosphate, kind of those functional groups on the outside of the carbon. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And I would be happy to, to take any questions. 